Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Sunday, 5 May 2024. It is the 206th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx, who was born in Trier on this date in 1818. One of the biggest problems with Marx's philosophy of history is that almost all work on it has been done by Marxists, that is to say, by true believers in Marxism. The few who are not true believers who took up historical materialism have done so in the shadow of the work that's done by the true believers. This puts the non-Marxists who engage with Marx's philosophy of history into a bind. It is a practical impossibility to master all of the relevant literature on Marx, unless perhaps you devote your entire life to it. But if you devoted your life instead to philosophy of history, you won't necessarily have read the whole of Marx and all of his commentators. From that, it follows that anything you say about Marx is likely to be gainsaid by someone who has focused their entire career on Marx. And they will have a response to any problems that you might raise, but the response is always formulated in a way that is entirely internal to the Marxist conceptual framework. If you don't share that conceptual framework, the argument is not likely to be very persuasive, but it is rare to find somebody well-versed in Marxist philosophy of history who is not a Marxist who feels compelled to defend Marx's view at any cost. As philosophers of history, however, what we want to know about any thinker is what we can learn from them about their conception of history, not necessarily to defend it, but to know what has been said and why it has been said. And we don't necessarily want to think ourselves into someone else's conceptual framework, and particularly not one that has been transformed into an ideology. Compare this situation with Marx to any number of other philosophers who have not been directly involved with philosophy of history, but who have said things relevant to it. So recently I produced a episode on Machiavelli. With the tradition of commenting on Machiavelli, Almost everything written on him was hostile up to the 19th century. People wrote about Machiavelli to condemn Machiavelli. And almost no one would cop to Machiavelli's ideology, even if they admitted to wanting to understand Machiavelli on his own terms. Another example, in my episode on Kant, I said that Kant never wrote a big book on philosophy of history, but a Kantian philosophy of history can be assembled from what he did write about history in a great many shorter writings. And this is similar to the situation with Marx, because Marx also didn't write a book specifically on philosophy of history, but he did leave a trail of clues in his other works from which we can reconstruct his conception of, of history. But with Kant, we have a great many studies of Kant's philosophy of history that maintain what we would call the proper distance between author and expositor, with no expectation that we, would go we are going to necessarily become Kantians if we read Kant's philosophy of history and endeavor to understand it. No one feels that they need to toe any Kantian line, though it can be said that there have been periods in German philosophical history when neo-Kantianism was nearly obligatory. And no one feels obligated to suspend all criticism until they have fully entered into the Kantian conceptual framework. Comprehension does not necessarily entail agreement. It tends to be a little bit different with Marx's commentators. The vast majority of Marx's critics have been internal critics of Marxism. Some of them rise above the mediocrity of that position. For example, Ernst Bloch was an internal critic of Marxism, was a mind of his own, and I would even say a first-rate philosopher. But most commentators never find their own voice. The true believers in Marxism view themselves as part of an embattled community, and therefore they feel the need to defend this community. And this takes the form of defending Marxist doctrines, including defending Marx's implicit philosophy of history. And this isn't helpful from a philosophical point of view, so we have to keep in mind. And I have to keep in mind that anything I say about Marx might well be contradicted by somebody who has a lot invested in Marx, which I don't. Probably no one was closer to Marx than Friedrich Engels, whom I think we can say closely shared Marx's conceptual framework to the point that Marx and Engels are sometimes treated as though they were interchangeable. They're not, but that was that has been a common way to present on all the communist 
propaganda posters, we always see a picture of Marx and, and Engels together with their profiles superimposed on each other. Engels gave a funeral oration at Marx's graveside that includes a good summary of Marx's views on history. And this is from Engels, quote, just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of development of human history, the simple fact hitherto concealed by an overgrowth of ideology that mankind must first of all eat, drink, and have shelter and clothing before it can pursue politics, science, art, religion, etc. That therefore the production of the immediate material means of subsistence and consequently the degree of economic development attained by a given people or during a given epoch form the foundation upon which the state institutions, the legal conceptions, art, and even the ideas on religion of the people concerned must have been evolved and in the light of which they must therefore be explained instead of vice versa, as had hitherto been the case, unquote. There are several familiar themes here, perhaps the most notable of which is that there are laws of human development and history. This is the classic claim of speculative philosophy of history. Also, the emphasis here on the material conditions of history as being the folk, the you be as being the forces driving history, and that the material conditions of human history are effectively economic conditions. These are all familiar Marxist talking points. The preface of Marx's critique of political economy is sometimes identified as the locus classicus of historical materialism. So I will read a longish passage from this, not even a full paragraph, but still enough to give a sense of what's going on. Quote, in the social production of their life, men enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their will, relations of production which correspond to a definite stage of development in their material productive forces. The sum total of these relations of productions constitutes the economic structure of society, the real basis on which rises a legal and political superstructure, and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the social, political, and intellectual life process in general. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. At a certain stage of their development, the material productive forces of society come in conflict with the existing relationships of production, or what is but the legal expression for the same thing, with the property relationships with which they have been at work hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters, then begins an epoch of social revolution. With the change of the economic foundation, the entire immense superstructure is more or less rapidly transformed. In considering such transformations, a distinction should always be made between the material transformation of the economic conditions of production, which can be determined with the precision of natural science, and the legal, political, religious, aesthetic, or philosophical, in short, ideological forms in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. Just as our opinion of an individual is not based on what he thinks of himself, so we cannot judge of such a period of transformation by its own consciousness. On the contrary, this consciousness must be explained rather from the contradictions of material life, from the existing conflict between the social productive forces and the relations of production. No social formation ever perishes before all the productive forces for which there is room in it have developed, and new higher relations of production never appear before the material conditions of their existence have matured in the womb of the old society itself. Therefore, mankind always sets itself only such tasks as it can solve, since looking at the matter more closely, it will always be found that the task itself arises only when the material conditions for its solution already exist, or are at least in the process of formation. In broad outlines, Asiatic, ancient, feudal, and modern bourgeois modes of production can be designated as progressive epochs in the economic foundation formation of society. 
The bourgeois relations of production are the last antagonistic form of the social process of production. Antagonistic, not in the sense of individual antagonism, but of one arising from the social conditions of life of the individuals. At the same time, the productive forces developing in the womb of bourgeois society create the material conditions for the solution of that antagonism. This social formation brings, therefore, the prehistory of human society to a close, unquote. So, like I said, that's kind of longish quote, but it's not even the whole paragraph that I took it out of. Um, and there's a lot going on in this passage, and I won't try to be exhaustive or comment at all. I'm just going to pluck out a few of what I consider to be Marx's leading ideas that are here and in many other passages. And I want to suggest that many of Marx's leading ideas, which are in this passage and in most of Marx's commentators, treated as an organic whole, can be isolated and taken independently, though we almost never see that. So I want to take out six ideas in particular and comment on them. And those six ideas will be materialism, cultural evolutionism, economic systems as the basis of cultural evolutionism, the base superstructure distinction, communist teleology, and determinism. So for Marx's materialism, I've already mentioned that the material conditions of history is a familiar Marxist talking point. And there are a great many passages that we can take from Marx to underline this, but here I will quote from one of them. Quote, we must begin by stating the first premise of all human existence and hence of all history. The premise, namely, that men must be able to live in order to make history. Once a need is satisfied, which requires the action of satisfying the acquisition of the instrument for this purpose, new needs arise. The production of new needs is the first historical act. They do not, they do not think of history at all, but of prehistoric times without explaining how we can get from the nonsense of prehistory to history pro proper. Um, so I, that was just some underlying pass unquote. That's from underlying passages from, I think it's the 1844 manuscripts. Uh, and like I said, we find this in Marx with some frequency. But there are also accounts of Marx that emphasize his debt to Hegel and to Hegel's idealism. John Zemito, in his philosophy of history, the German tradition from Herder to Marx, discusses in some detail the influence both of Hegel and Comte, and he ends his essay with this, quote, in Marx, we see a philosophy of history that draws on both the Enlightenment and idealism for its premises. The driving interest in his thought derives from idealism. It is the aspiration to an ethical totality to be realized in the end of history, providing meaning to the entire sweep of history with all its toil and trouble. But the method that animates his thought is taken from the Enlightenment and its aspiration to a social science based on principles authorized by natural science. Similarly, the radicalism of Marx's projection of positive values into the future compares with the doctrine of progress of the Enlightenment. Yet, if one takes away the utopianism of Marx's teleology of history, and one takes away the romanticism of his criterion of fulfilled humanity, the balance of his thought has the features of a science that falls all the way back to the mechanism of late Enlightenment science of man. That was the past that was that thought on that was the path that thought on society and history would follow in the balance of the modern period. Indeed, after and through Marx, the question of making sense of history passed definitively out of the hands of philosophy into those of the newly constituted social sciences." Unquote. I myself do not agree that after Marx, the question of making sense of history passed definitively out of the hands of philosophy, but I think we can see uh, what Zamita was getting at. And we can find uh, a basis for this replacement of philosophy by science in Marx. So here's another um, extract from Marx. Quote, 
History itself is an actual part of natural history, of nature's development into man. Natural science will in time include the science of man as the science of man will include natural science. There will be one science, unquote, with one italicized there. So philosophy is going to give way to science and science is going to be unified into a whole that is going to give us this whole Marxian account of things. After Marx, Marx Weber called for, Max Weber called for a rationalization of history that was not a philosophy of history. And Weber's work on the methodology of the social sciences has been extremely influential. So there have been trends that point in this direction. But whether Weber or any other post-Marxian social scientists managed to displace philosophy as a sense-making tool for history is, in my view, not at all clear. Certainly, this is not a proposition with which most philosophers of history would agree. Another interesting thing in the quote from Zamito is his suggestion of setting aside Marx's utopianism and his teleology. This is exactly what I'm trying to show, that there are many permutations of the Marxist conception of history based not only on our interpretations of the elements of Marxist thought, but which elements we include and which elements we set aside as being no longer relevant. Because whenever we're faced with a large corpus of work, which we certainly are with the vast corpus of Marx's writings, Engels' writings, and all their commentators, our selection, like any history, is going to be... Uh, is going to be selective. It's not going to be the whole of it. So that, that much I will say on materialism for the moment. Cultural evolution was another leading idea I wanted to talk about. Like Marx's theory of history, his exposition of cultural evolutionism is scattered across many texts and appears in a fragmentary form, but it's pretty well established uh, that the, uh, the idea that human society passes through stages from primitive communism to slavery to feudalism and capitalism, and Marx posited a further stage of industri industrialized communism that follows after capitalism. Because Marx's exposition is unsystematic, there have been many slightly different accounts of the stages of Marx's cult cultural evolutionism, but they all reflect pretty much the same point of view. I would say that the main rival to Marx's cultural evolutionism is Franz Boas's cultural relativism. And the contrast between Marx's evolutionism and Boas's relativism helps give us a sense of what is at stake in the claims that Marx makes. We could say that we have both evolutionist intuitions about history and relativist intuitions about history. And Marx and Boas each build on these distinct intuitions and as they build on these diverging intuitions, the more their thought diverges, the farther we follow the reasoning of either of them. Both Marx's cultural evolutionism and Boaz's cultural relativism have become so familiar to us that we scarcely realize when we are invoking either of them. But we should be clear about when our thinking is implicitly invoking either evolutionism or relativism or both, because sometimes we find both of them in one person. For example, Spengler's philosophy of history, which you probably didn't expect to hear about in con conjunction with Marx or Boaz, has elements in them that are derived from both cultural evolutionism and cultural relativ relativism. So we can find in his philosophy echoes of both Marx and Boaz. Specifically, Spengler's idea that all civilizations rise up from an undifferentiated mass of history and each is incommensurable with any other civilization is akin to cultural relativism. While Spengler's contention that all civilizations pass through definite stages in a determinate order is akin to cultural evolutionism. So the two, evolutionism and relativism, are not necessarily mutually in exclusive, though when we build exclusively on one set of historical intuitions or the, or the other, these forms of thought tend to diverge and they seem to be irreconcilable. So I've talked about materialism and cultural evolutionism. Uh, next, I'm going to take up economic systems as the basis of cultural evolutionism.
So Marx's cultural evolutionism is driven by economic systems, and economic systems grow naturally out of the satisfaction of human needs, as we saw in some of the, the earlier quotes I made. It would be possible to formulate a conception of history defined by cultural evolutionism, but in which it is not economics, but something else that is the driver of the historical process. Here we see the, when we consider this contrary to Marx alternative, um, we can see the relationship between Marx's materialism and the other components of his conception of history. Since any alternative to a system of economics that grows out of human needs would need to appeal to mind or to consciousness or to ideals of some time. And the first leading idea I plucked out of Marx was, was his materialism. So his materialism centers on, on these aspects of, of society rather than the ideal aspects of society. And but we don't necessarily have to uh, construe it in that way. Jakob Burkhardt's conception of history, while not being a form of cultural evolutionism, does place the mind and its ideals as the drivers of history, and so presents us with an example of a conception of history in which economic and industry are only distant, secondary, and immediate causes <clears throat> in the development of the historical process. Burkhardt's conception of historical development is as antithetical to Marx's conception of human development as Boaz's cultural relativism is antithetical to Marx's cultural evolutionism. So uh, next up, uh, the base superstructure distinction, which is pretty familiar in, in even with a, a passing acquaintance with Marx. Because the economic system grows out of the satisfaction of human needs, and this is the primary driver of the historical process, it follows that this is the basis of the entire society. The apparently non-economic functions of a society like art, religion, science, law, and political institutions are not really independent of economic forces in Marx, but are in fact created by economic forces. The ideals to which we believe we are given express, giving expression in the highest cultural product productions of a society are not something independent of human needs, but are a part of the rationalization and the justification of the existing economic order of society. In this way, these cultural expressions of a society are mere epiphenomenon of the economic base of society, and that's why they are called the superstructure. This, this distinction is also sometimes, instead of, sometimes it's called economic base and cultural superstructure, sometimes it's called infrastructure versus superstructure. And the purpose of the superstructure is, to put it in vulgar terms, to make us feel good about ourselves and to justify the economic exploitation that makes the productions of high culture possible. I assume it was this idea that Walter Bonneman had in mind when he said that every document of civilization is at the same time a document of barbarism. As a cultural critic, Bonneman was well placed to appreciate high culture productions of society, but he believed himself to have seen through the violence, oppression, and suffering entailed by their creation. So, for example, any great work of art in the past, we can take it out of a a a a, a, a society that still has institutions like slavery or fails to have any degree of popular sovereignty, but they were the, the dictators and tyrants were able to spend large amount of money on lavish public buildings and sculpture and decorative art, et cetera. And you can take this as, as, as an ideal expression of, of a pre-modern society, but you could also see it as a testament, testament to the, oppressive institutions that made the extraction of that wealth and its expression in forms of art possible. So this is, we could say, a highly reductionist account of art and ideals and intellectual achievement. And there are varieties of Marxism that flourished after Marx's time, like Antonio Gramsci's cultural Marxism. Gramsci didn't call it that. That's what it's come to be called after Gramsci's time. And these varieties of cultural Marxism value the productions of culture rather differently. So Marxism doesn't necessarily have to have be uh, reliant upon a reductionist account of non-economic value. <clears throat> 
So that's the, the base superstructure distinction. Uh, next on my list is communist teleology. That's just a term I plucked out of the air. I don't know if there's an established uh, vocabulary in Marxism to cover this. Like I said, if you come into Marxism as an outsider, you will not know all the details of the exposition of this conceptual framework. But in Marx, obviously, the process of cultural evolutionism culminates in communism. And there are several accounts of exactly how this comes about and how many stages intervene between communist revolution and the achievement of the final communist society. For example, whether the expropriation of the expropriators leads directly to communism or whether society must pass through a period of the dictatorship of the proletariat before the state can wither away and true communism appears. And if the latter, how long the dictatorship of the proletariat has to endure and how long it takes for the state to wither away. Those are, there are many different variations that can be taken by taking different alternative interpretations of, of any of those factors. But however communism comes about, communism is the end point of cultural evolutionism in Marx. So cultural evolutionism, as we've seen, is expressed in a series of distinct economic systems or relationships of production. And once a society achieves the communist mode of production, it has achieved its final form. But Marx didn't have to make that assertion. We could just as well argue that communism is one more mode of production, which will in its turn eventually be followed by another mode of production. If the other mode of production still to follow is something unprecedented in history that isn't been accounted in the stages in Marx's cultural evolutionism, then history is still directional, but it does not necessarily converge on a finite teleology. We could posit an infinite infinitude of stages of economic development following capitalism and communism as well, which would um, also defy any finite teleology in, in, uh, in these other factors like cultural evolutionism. Or alternatively, it could be argued that the communism that is achieved as the final end state of cultural evolutionism is a stage and a cycle of stages that repeat over historical time that would give us a cyclical theory of history. For example, if the attainment of a perfect communist society coincided with the primitive communism prior to the slave mode of production, which sometimes Marx called the Asiatic mode of production, then the whole cycle would start over again, and this would not be a form of teleology. So you can have these other elements of Marx's philosophy of history without necessarily having it be teleological. So the last of the leading ideas that I mentioned is determinism. And Marx's philosophy of history is usually taken to be deterministic, or if you like an adjective, rigidly deterministic. Partly this is because cultural evolutionism, cultural evolutionism is widely believed to be essentially deterministic. This belief is false because we can easily formulate cultural evolutionism in a non-deterministic way, as I try, try to show in a moment. We need not be deterministic about cultural evol evolutionism any more than we need to be deterministic about biological evolutionism. The deterministic argument can be made, but it's not obvious and it's not necessary. However, it is true that many who have argued for cultural evolutionism have offered deterministic account of the origins and development of societies, and Marx's account certainly suggests this. And so we have a finite number of stages, and each stage logically leads on to the next stage that follows it. And so it has to go, it has to be these number of stages, it has to go in this order, and it has to terminate in communism or whatever. Wherever we find a claim of inevitability, we are in the presence of determinism, and we find many claims of inevitability in Marx. For example, here's a sentence from, or part of a sentence from Capital, quote, there can be no doubt that when the working class comes into power, as inevitably it must, technical instruction, both theoretical and practical, will take its proper place in the working class schools, unquote. There are many ways in which historical materialism could be formulated in ways in which it was not deterministic, but still largely Marxist in its orientation. For example, one could hold that a society 
might possibly collapse at any stage of its development, with this collapse being a contingent event not determined by prior circumstances. If a society can collapse at any point in this development, and it does not necessarily pass through all the stages of cultural evolutionism in a determinate order, and does not necessarily pass through all of these stages, then Marx's cultural evolutionism ceases to be deterministic. So I've named off six leading ideas in Marx. Um, materialism, cultural evolutionism, economic systems is the basis of cultural evolutionism, the base superstructure distinction, communist teleology, and determinism. If we take these six ideas and we pair each of the ideas with its antithesis, which might lead us leave us with the list of, for example, idealism, cultural relativism, historical de development not driven by economics, consciousness and its ideals as the basis of social institutions, denial of teleology and indeterminism. So we've got these six on one side and six on the other side, and they we can match them up as, as, as logical opposites. They're not purely logical opposites, then we would just be negating each term if we wanted to do that. Um, but but just to get a conceptual sketch of, of what I'm suggesting here, we've got six leading ideas and we could swap out any one or any combination of them for the other. We get 64 possible permutations of these elements. And that means a possibility of 64 different philosophy of histories that overlap with Marx's philosophy of history, more or less related to Marx, but not precisely coinciding with Marx. Because of the party spirit that pervades Marx's thought, we rarely see these closely related alternatives being explored, though, as we saw in the quote from John Zamito, sometimes philosophers will set aside aspects of Marx's thought in order to arrive at what feels to them a more satisfactory formulation. Some of these permutations implied by what I've sketched out here would be unlikely to say the least, but all could give us a novel perspective on Marx and historical materialism. But there are still many other ways we could approach Marx's conception of history. For example, another pro potentially profitable way to approach Marx from the perspective of philosophy of history would be to engage with Marx's conception of revolution. I opened uh, this episode by quoting from Engel's funeral oration for Marx. And in the same funeral oration where he gives that sketch of Marx's conception of history, Engels commented on Marx's commitment to revolution. Quote, Marx was before all else a revolutionist. His real mission in life was to contribute in one way or another to the overthrow of capitalist society and of the state institutions which it had brought into being, unquote. So even if a revolution is anticipated or purposefully precipitated, a revolution is a historical crisis. And if we take this mode of approach to Marx, Marx could be assimilated to those many philosophers of history who have focused on crisis, like Pitarim Sorokin. But I will leave that for another time, and that is much as I will say about Marx for today. So happy birthday, Karl Marx, and thanks for listening.